everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. This morning, I have my partner in education, partner in shenanigans, I guess, um, with me, Dr. William Lester from Hernando County Extension. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, everybody. This morning, we're going to um, discuss, it's kind of one of those things that have come back around. Basically, you know, the way I grew up and probably, you know, the way you grew up, um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, you grew up in Maryland, half in Pennsylvania, half in Florida, and people were not as obsessed with their lawns, I don't think then. It could have been the um, the social culture I was in, but, you know, they didn't, well, especially up north, lawns seem to just grow no matter, you know, what you do with them. It's a little bit more difficult in Florida, but it does happen. Um, and we're going to discuss how you can basically have a lawn that allows you to be free from being a slave to your lawn. <coughs> and we're going to talk about letting freedom lawns ring. And uh, we will let you know right here, both Dr. Lester and I each have a freedom lawn. We don't put many inputs into our lawns at all. So alternatives to the traditional lawn. If you would like a PDF copy of this program when I'm finished, just email me, um, Lily B with two L's in the middle at hernandocounty.us. Or if you have questions you would like follow up on, please email me. But if it's a really, really hard question, then you get on here to wlester at ufl.edu and Dr. Lester can help you out. Here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And the interesting thing is when we're talking about freedom lawns, every one of these principles, except one that I have modified, <laughs> um, will fit in today's program. Definitely right plant, right place. The number one principle, it's the number one topic of our discussion today. Watering efficiently, uh, fertilizing appropriately kind of like not at all <laughs> in, in this particular program, um, except um, once in a while you can um, add some compost. I changed number four of mulch to compost when we're talking about our freedom lawn. It will attract more pollinators, more wildlife, more gopher tortoises, more rabbits. We both have those things. Um, manage yard pests responsibly, recycling, and all of all of these things will help reduce stormwater runoff in the long run and protect our waterfront. Before I get very much further in this program, you know, there are people that, you know, Florida Friendly Landscaping across the state has run across that want to utilize the program, Florida Friendly Landscaping, in order to not maintain their yard at all. Um, and that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're here for. We're not, if you're looking for a program that's going to help you, um, do whatever you want to, even if you live in a uh, deed restricted community, let me share with you in order to have a Florida friendly certified landscape, which you can do, you don't have to but it's something you can do, you know, it's, it's a recognition that you can achieve and, but it's, you know, it's, um, there's a process to it and I will be glad to help you with it. I do, I do that. Um, you'll get a sign like this, but let me remind you, especially if you live in an HOA, the very, very first thing, the very first check mark I have to check off is client confirms or my eyes confirm that the landscape complies with all codes, laws, ordinances, and HOA rules if applicable. So if you're in an HOA and they are very strict that you must have a St. Augustine uh, lawn, a Floritan lawn, this program is not going to be able to help you get out of that. You know, that is the, the life that you chose by moving to that community. 
we can help you and we have other programs you know for that we can help you take care of that floor tan lawn appropriately those are different classes that we have aren't they dr lister yes they're different topics and we go to communities we we just booked a date <laughs> to go to a um nearby community gate deed restricted communities where they are having issues with their floor tan lawns and we will help them out you know because they don't have a choice this is what they have to have so we are going to work with them in the best management practices thereof this particular class is if you if that is not a mandate for you and you are freer to have you know a decent uh, a different kind of lawn so i will let dr lester take over in this history here of why why we have lawns to begin with Okay, we don't want to get too deep into the history of lawns, but if you're wondering, why do we even have lawns anyway? Why do people obsess over what's growing out in their front yard and it has to be a certain type of grass and it has to be maintained a certain way? Most people didn't really have any kind of traditional lawn until the late 1800s. And even then it was just very wealthy people. Um, maybe you had a mansion, maybe you had a good sized piece of property, but people would plant more of a lawn than a pasture because before that, everybody would have to be sustainable and everybody had chickens and they had cows and goats and whatever other animals and livestock they were raising. And you basically used your lawn as a pasture for them to feed on. So uh, we did invent the real mower. That's the one, if you remember, and if anybody remembers watching Leave it to Beaver, that they push along mm -hmm. and it's just mechanical and it spins. And I think of the Waltons. I think of the Waltons when I think of real mowers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my guess is the Waltons probably didn't obsess over their lawn that whatever grew out front was yes. whatever grew out front. The kids played on it and they had a real mower and garden hoses and things like that that made actually managing grass just for looking at not really serving any other purpose not animal feed not for you know ed anything edible for the family to you know live on but just for looks that's when that practice first started and of course has carried on since then and you can see how things have changed and lily mentioned that the two of us grew up up north i grew up in maryland everybody had a lawn People, I don't remember anybody having any kind of in-ground sprinkler system at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. We all cut the lawns. When I was a kid, I would cut the neighbor's lawns for $5. That was kind of my first job. But people wouldn't, they, there were no services that came and fertilized it. People, I don't recall them ever spraying for any kind of insect problems. The lawns would always have lots of dandelions and clover and things that were not specifically turf grass growing in them. And that was fine. Nobody obsessed over it. I grew up in um, suburban Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., and that's what everybody had then. I'm sure it's changed now. I know things are very different in Florida yes. now with turf grass and having to maintain the perfect lawn. So, yeah, it, lawns technically, the way that we manage them and have them now have not been around for all that long, not that many years. All right, that's... Talk about, um, you know, to, a lot of people may think turf is evil. <laughs> it is not inherently evil. It has, you know, its benefits and its places. I'll let you talk about the benefits. Sure. With most anything biological outdoors, there's pluses and minuses. So there are benefits to having turf grass on your property, covering the dirt around your house. Um, it can look attractive. It does help to raise property values, although that kind of depends. It depends on exactly where the housing market is. Uh, is demand for houses low, in which case you need to make yours look just as good as you possibly can. Right now, demand is very high. So literally, whatever the heck you have growing out front is probably not going to make a big difference in your house value or sellability. 
I think most of us, if we put a for sale sign out front this morning, within a day or two, we're going to have an offer, no matter what kind of lawn we have, good, bad, or in between. Um, research has found that turf grass does reduce stormwater runoff. It does slow it down, helps to reduce erosion. Grass does very well at filtering out impurities, um, different pollutants and things that if they reach the gutter, you can see in the very front of this picture here, and run off into a retention pond or a water body is going to cause a pollution problem. Helps to reduce erosion. Grass is a plant. It does take up carbon dioxide. It is a carbon sink. It does produce oxygen, so that's good. Helps to cool and clean the air. Options to lawns, things like rocks, concrete, things like that are going to get much hotter than a lawn will. Lawns do help to reduce or moderate the temperature around your house a little bit. Can reduce glare and noise. And sometimes it might be the most practical choice for some areas. So turf grass in some situations is the right plant for the right place. In other situations, it's not. So it's a uh, plus and minus. It really depends on the exact situation and location. It does reduce uh, noise in your neighborhood. On the other hand, um, highly maintained lawn, well, even a lowly maintained lawn, like we're going to talk about, creates noise pollution in the care thereof. So, you know, it's kind of, it has its good points and its bad points. Yeah, I'm sure that there's some subdivisions on, let's say, uh, uh, any given Wednesday morning, if you walk outside, you're going to hear lawnmower noise from every different direction because it can be a noisy proposition to maintain. So yes. good points I, and bad points. I was driving around one day a couple of years ago, you know, during work hours and driving through neighborhoods and seeing all the busyness that went around lawn care. I was, you know, going around these trucks and these trailers and everyone was scurrying around and, you know, taking care of these lawns and I was it occurred to me as much money that we put out and as much uh effort and attention we pay to that lawn I was thinking a thousand years from now archaeologists may come to the conclusion that we worshiped our lawns <laughs> because of how much effort you know the community put into it it was just just a thought I had <laughs> Now, since I work for Hernando County Utilities for the Water Department, I want to bring out some of this, uh, these statistics. And these I got these at the bottom um, rectangle there. You can see it came from Duval County. It's a master gardener who posted this in a blog. Um, but Duval County Extension um, posted these numbers. And I can fairly much agree that they are you know, not off target. So studies show that 62% of water used in Central Florida is used for irrigation. That's about what, um, you know, the same number we hear at Hernando County Utilities come with. At least 60% of the water that we distribute to our customers gets put on lawns. That's mind boggling when you, when you think about it. So, you know, everyone's moving here now. During COVID, a lot of people moved in. I mean, people have been moving in, pouring in probably since the 70s, 80s. You know, they were coming before that, but many, many people came in the 80s. I'm going to pick on the 80s because that's when you came, isn't it, Dr. List? <laughs> yes, the early 80s. Well, I was brought here in the late 70s. <laughs> <laughs> haven't found my way out yet, but, um, you know, COVID is created one of the surges because people found out I don't have to live in the congested city. You know, I can work remotely. I'm going to move to Florida. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I know people in the Northeast, I, my family can never afford it to buy a home here. Let's go where mom and dad are in Florida. You know, just lots of reasons that people come down and they're continuing to. So public demand for water is projected to increase 39% by 2030. 2030 is not too far away. That's only, what, seven years away, basically. And so if we have all the more and more and more and more people coming, I think there's going to have to be choices made 
with how we use the water. And if right now 60% is being thrown on lawns, I think we may need to change that. You know, we're not gonna be able to be as freewheeling with spending that water, you know, when more and more people come. I think they're probably, if 60% was not going towards lawns, there would be plenty for people to use for people purposes, <laughs> you know, even if our uh, uh, population continues to increase. So they say that demand for fresh water in Florida will rise to 1.3 billion gallons per day. Billion <laughs> per day. And according to a study that St. John's Water Management District and the Suwannee River Water Management District uh, conducted, water demand will rise to 667 million gallons per day by 2035, which will result in a 117 um, million gallon per day shortfall in water supply over the 20 year planning window. So just to make you aware, you know, we think it's an infinite resource. We've had the same water since the beginning of time. Therefore, it is a finite resource. And we know that only what 1% of that water that we that we possess is available for, you know, human use, animal use, mammal use, reptile use, all of that. Um, you know, that is available uh, for drinking, uh, for growing crops, you know, all those things that we might need it for. Here is a study I conducted, and I only just made Dr. Lester aware of this um, when he got on the program this morning before, before 10. Um, these are actual, um, taken from Hernando County Utilities actual uh, database of two of our customers. Um, I won't tell you who the one on the left is, but I will let you know it is someone who, you know, basically waters once a week, following our county, you know, rules. Because the, the amount that they use is consistent with someone who waters once a week. Two people live in that home. The one on the right may or may not be the consumption of somebody on this very program <laughs> right now. So, yeah, no, that's, that's my bill. Yeah, okay. So since it's a little difficult to, you know, see how they say this, I will explain it to you. This person in July of 2022, it's weird how the numbers are here. So they used 13,100 gallons of water that month, that, you know, billing cycle. In June, they used 23,700. May 26,400. That was high because why? Because it wasn't raining yet, you know, in May. It took a long time to May rain in June, too. These 20,000 mark is fairly typical of someone. This is two people, a couple. Uh, I believe they did have um, a, you know, a relative in need of some care living with them through part of this you know, but they water, you know, following our watering restrictions and they use approximately 20,000 gallons a month. Now these people over here, the Lesters, <laughs> this is the, you know, their consumption in July, Dr. Lester, you used 5,100 gallons. You do not irrigate your landscape, correct? No, I do have a vegetable garden that I water. So there's certain months where during, you know, peak vegetable gardening times here in Central Florida, I'm going to use more water. July, I had very little growing out there and we're getting so much rain that I probably didn't turn the sprinklers on the entire month for the vegetable garden. But May, it was hot and dry. So, you know, you use mm -hmm. a little bit more, 9,100 compared to this person used 26,000. 400. Remember, they irrigate their lawn. Dr. Lester does not. You also have two people, and now you have also taken in a relative, you know, in need of some assistance. Same yep. scenarios, really. These are a couple that took in an aunt 
you are a couple that took in, you know, a mother-in-law. So same situation. What is the only difference? You don't irrigate your lawn. They do. They use, I, I, these numbers I came up with just from July to July, you know, to make it a 12 month um, period, they use 267,000 gallons. You used 85, 200. They use 68% more water because they irrigate their lawn than you who do not, who has this freedom lawn. That, and I, you know, I'm not showing your bill amount, <laughs> but I bet yours is a whole lot less than theirs too. So why don't you talk about fertilizer in lawns, Dr. Lester, now that we have exposed your water <laughs> consumption? <laughs> Sure. A normal part of growing a proper turf grass lawn is going to involve fertilizing. Now, I know that we've had separate classes about this. Uh, Hernando County does have a fertilizer ordinance. Most counties in Florida now have some kind of fertilizer ordinance or will be implementing them. They're all different. So depending on what county you live in, you need to be aware of your county's fertilizer ordinance. But that's all done because when people fertilize their lawn, a lot of times they're trying to compensate for other problems. They may have an underlying disease problem, soil problem, and they figure that, well, if I put enough fertilizer out there and then I water it enough and put enough water on it, my grass is gonna look perfect. And that almost never happens because if your problem is really something else, that problem is not being solved by fertilizing or watering and the problem will keep going and your lawn will still have problems. So the problem is when people fertilize too much, unless you fertilize just, just right, just properly, that excess fertilizer that you're putting on your lawn is gonna get washed off. It's either gonna leach and go downwards through the sandy soil into the groundwater and cause problems that way, or it's gonna get washed off, it's gonna run down the gutter and it's gonna go somewhere. It's going to go into either a retention pond, a lake, a river. If you live right on the coast, it's going to go straight in the Gulf of Mexico. And different components in turf fertilizer cause different pollution problems. The two biggest problems are nitrogen and phosphorus. Both of them can result in algae blooms, which we remember from being in the news a few years ago. Red tide, green algae. You see the picture on the right here. How often have you seen a body of water that looks green and nasty? What is one of the factors that's causing that is uh, fertilizer runoff. And that fertilizer can also adversely affect fish, fisheries, mammals, everything from manatees to sports fishing. The little baby fish that live right up next to the coast are being impacted. When those kind of problems pop up, it adversely affects tourism. Obviously, if you want to go on vacation, you're not going to go and visit that pond on the right. Mm -hmm. You know, not a really good vacation hotspot, I would guess. So these things, the fertilizer problems can cause a lot of different issues and then secondary and then third level issues also. It kind of compounds and piles up. When the problem gets to the point where researchers, scientists in the state of Florida have to take notice of it. Now they're going to implement rules, things like fertilizer ordinances, um, bans on fertilizing, a lot of problems. So don't think that you fertilizing your lawn and just, well, I really want my lawn to look good. So I'm just going to throw a little bit extra on, or I'm not going to measure it or I'm gonna do it you know, maybe more often than what is recommended. All of us who are fertilizing lawns are kind of a part of the problem. We all have a part to play in that. And, and backing up a little bit, there was a question in the chat um, that I should address that asked um, if I was referring to city water or aquifer water. Very good question because, I mean, what I was showing you here obviously was people on um, a municipality's water system that they pay for here in Hernando County. But the question is whether it's city water or aquifer water, and the answer is yes, because 
any municipality, not any, um, here in Hernando County, whether or not you get your water from Hernando County Utilities, from the city of Brooksville, or from your own private well, we are all getting it from the aquifer, which is why, um, you know, here in Hernando County, every single person who has property is on the one day a week per watering uh, watering schedule. Even if you are taking it from a private well, even if that well is connected to a surface water source, we are still all on one day a week watering. So when you ask, is it city water? Is it aquifer water? The answer is yes, <laughs> because even as municipalities, we have big wells that take it from the aquifer, whereas individuals out there not on the system have individual wells, which also take it from the aquifer. So monocultures, I'll start a little bit and then I'll let Dr. Lester talk about it too. What does the word monoculture mean? Well, one, you know, mono, one culture, one type of, um, you know, organism, monoculture. Lawns, <laughs> lawns, as we just mentioned, you know, lawns have boomed, I would say in the last hundred years for sure, 50, absolutely. So that there are approximately 4 million acres of managed turf grass in Florida. And declines in beneficial insects, you have seen that firsthand, haven't you, Dr. Lester? the declines in beneficial insects, even the declines in pest insects <laughs> you've even noticed. Yeah, we, we've noticed that when people bring in um, turf grass samples and we look at it, we basically see nothing alive in it. There's nobody living in your lawn. Don't worry too much. If you have a service that sprays your lawn, they're not shy about spraying it a lot. And unfortunately, they've uh, eliminated you know, they, it does a good, an effective job of controlling the pest insects, but it's eliminated all the beneficial ones also. And, you know, when we come in and we have taken away whatever was in a community like this before, I mean, it's possible that they're reusing a citrus grove or a pasture, you know, um, but what it was originally was just natural Florida. You take all that away, therefore it stands to reason that there's gonna be a decline in our beneficial insects, in plant varieties, native plants, and also the birds. Um, then the birds that were lost, you know, every year Audubon across the country does their Christmas bird count. So they try to find out, you know, and of course it's decreasing, <laughs> overall it's decreasing each year. I mean, some years they may have seen more cardinals than they saw the previous year, but overall it's decreasing. And so 90% of the birds that were lost were terrestrial birds that require insects to feed their young. So those glossy ibises and things like that, that we see walking around, picking at the ground, you know, they're trying to get insects that we're trying to kill. And it says, according to this blog from Duval County Extension, uh, that in two generations, so what is that, 40 years, basically, mm -hmm. we have lost one in four Blue Jays, one in three Baltimore Orioles, one in three Rose-breasted Grosbeaks, and one in three White-throated Sparrows. You may not have even associated what your lawn could possibly be doing to birds, because you may see plenty of birds. I just know we're taking away their food source, you know, that's, that's going to have an effect. So let's also refer to how uh, tough turf can be, Dr. Lester. Yeah, turf grass can be difficult to grow, and this is really site specific, and it depends on exactly what kind of turf grass you're trying to grow, and it depends on exactly what your expectations are. If you want to try growing, let's say, St. Augustine turf grass in Spring Hill, and you want it to look absolutely perfect, that's going to be very, very difficult to do. So turf grass, depending on your soil and exactly where you're located, may not be the best uh, choice for a plant to grow out in your front lawn. Maybe um, 
<clears throat> increasing the size of flower beds or uh, growing a more diverse uh, group of plants like both Lily and I do, things that we have growing in our yards is going to be a, a better choice. But it can be difficult because we do have a number of different turf grass diseases here. Uh, some of them can be controlled to a certain extent, but other ones are, are going to be a continual problem. They're not going to go away. There is nothing to, there's no magic spray I can recommend for you to use, and it's going to make your problem totally go away. We do have certain insect pests that are problems with certain types of turf grass here. Basically, every turf grass has its insect pest, and trying to eliminate all of them in your yard is not going to work well either. So if you live in, let's say, a subdivision in Spring Hill, St. Augustine may be the wrong plant trying to grow it in your yard, depending on the soil you have, it's putting it in the wrong place. And on top of that, if you manage it incorrectly, which many people do, and unfortunately many services don't, will not give you the best advice or recommendations on how to manage that turf, if you manage it incorrectly, things are not gonna work out well. You're gonna end up with a very bad looking lawn. It's going to die. You're gonna to have to replace it. And that's not cheap. I mean, it never was cheap, but it's a lot more expensive now. And if you replace the lawn and continue to manage it the same way you did, you're gonna get the same results in one to three years and you're gonna to have to do it again. So turf can be very tough to grow here in Florida. It doesn't, magically thrive all on its own, like maybe other types of turf grass in other states do. You have even mentioned before that in some places if they keep insisting and um, mowing it too low is an issue, but if they keep insisting on having um, this type of turf put back where it had a disease, there's a fungal disease called take all root rot, yet um, the communities insist you put the same type of grass back down in the area, that had that disease problem, you've said they should just work into their finances that their lawn is gonna be a short-lived perennial. Like you just said, maybe every three or four years that you're replacing it. That is the most expensive perennial plan I have ever heard of. <laughs> so. Yes, sometimes it will get to that point if you insist on continuing to replace your turf grass with the same type of turf grass, that have problems and you manage it the same way, uh, you may have to replace, I've seen St. Augustine lawns die in as little as one year. You can figure an average of maybe three years. So we've had to actually tell people, if you insist on doing this, get a quote on getting your um, yard resodded, take that dollar amount and divide it by 36. And that's how much you need to put away every month for replacing your lawn because it's going to have to be done again within three years. And people don't like that. No. that that's, that's very expensive. That's very expensive. It's not sustainable for their budget or the environment. And speaking of which, lawn maintenance is expensive. Would you like to elaborate on that? Well, it can be. Lawn maintenance for me is not. All I do is I cut my grass. I have an electric lawnmower, so I don't have to go and purchase gasoline and store it in a garage and stink everything up, but I'm not having to go out there and buy that expensive gasoline to do that with. I don't do anything else to my lawn, but a lot of people do. So if you hire a lawn service to keep your grass cut, you hire another service to come out there and fertilize, spray for imaginary insects, not treat appropriately for diseases, that's going to cost you a lot of money. If you decide to do it on your own, you can, but it's still going to cost you money for the raw materials that you're putting down, costs you a lot of time. And what is your time worth? Costs a lot of resources. If you start looking at, I know you talked about and showed the number of gallons that it takes to mm -hmm. irrigate your lawn. If you start to look at the number of pounds of nitrogen that are applied to lawns, the number of pounds of insecticides, it dwarfs commercial agriculture. So if you think that farms and ranchers and nurseries are the problems to water pollution, I think the, the number I saw was just homeowner residential lawns 
will end up using about 10 times as much water, fertilizer, and pesticides as commercial enterprises do because they're trying to make a profit. Right. They can't spend unlimited amounts of money on this stuff. They have to work smarter, not harder. They right. can't just go out, ah, buy another truck of fertilizer and two trucks of pesticide. We'll throw it out and hope for the best. They'll go broke or people who did that did go broke. Mm -hmm. So they have to work trying, smarter. If they're trying to manage 50 acres, they have to be very budget conscious. And like you said, it's a business. They want to make a profit. Whereas, you know, just your retired couple on quarter an acre um, I'm going to pick on the gentleman. It may not be him, but he's out there with his quarter acre. He can afford to decide, no, I'm going to put down two bags instead of one. You multiply him by the you know, hundreds of thousands, and that's where you end up with the issues, with the uh, fertilizer runoff and all sorts of other, other issues. Well, um, you can just totally, you know, again, if you're in a situation where you don't have very strict rules, people have totally replaced the idea of um, grass with a couple of different kind of lawn covers. Um, Bill and I have a friend who, this is her lawn. It's entirely the sunshine mimosa, mimosa strigolosa. <laughs> it's a native plant. Um, once it's done putting out all these pink, you know, puff balls. They mow it with a regular mower. It's not something you want to, none of these, is for, well, the perennial peanut, you might be able to. None of these are for barefoot walking. <laughs> um, the next two are not native, but they're, you know, fairly decent ground covers. The, uh, well, I got these in reverse order, but here's your dwarf Asiatic jasmine. It's going to stay dark green all year long but it's more like a vine on the ground. And then perennial peanut, people do utilize that. Both of these can be very aggressive. Well, all three of these can start to be pretty aggressive. Um, these two are going to brown out in the winter, just like your, you know, your grass may. Um, what I would do with them, if you're thinking, see what a lot of people do is they think I want to, not worry about taking care of this lawn and they want a different plant that will care, cover that same amount of area like a low ground cover, which that is what happens you know, in this situation. But what I would do is uh, make that area smaller by using more plant beds, planting more trees, you know, doing things like that, and then using smaller areas to put down these low ground covers you know, to kind of get that, that look that you're going for. That's just some of them. These are the most popular that people use for low growing, spreading ground cover. I know you have the perennial peanut at the Master Gardener Nursery and it tends to be quite aggressive. And some people with the native uh, sunshine mimosa, the lady who has it uh, for a lawn absolutely loves it. Your Master Gardeners despise it <laughs> because it took over some flower beds and I can't get it to grow hardly at all. So, you know, it just depends on the situation and what you're looking for. Now, so what we will get into now is what describe what we're talking about with a freedom lawn. And this word I took from um, Jenny Steibolt um, and some of her uh, web pages, but a lawn laced with whatever grows. Actually, I think this was a, the a Master Gardener site. You are free from synthetic fertilizer. Yay, you know, that Bill just discussed. Free from herbicides. Why are you free from herbicides? Because we want those weeds <laughs> to grow. We're going to use those as a good cover. The weeds are welcome. And there's a saying Master Gardeners have, and that uh, Dr. Lester and I live by green mowable looks good at 30 miles an hour as someone is going past. And what you're free from is you're free from that high maintenance. What I'm showing you here is, um, this is my original lawn. I'm only showing a small part of it that was, is and was Bahia grass. There's still some Bahia grass in there. 
we bought the lawn, the lot next door. And my husband cleared the, like the front of the lot. So this was like in August. We never put any grass seed down. We never put any sod down. We did nothing except he exposed some sunlight there. That looks pretty grassy, doesn't it to you, Dr. Lester? That looks fine. Um, the key is to have basically the bare dirt covered. Yeah. And it covered itself. <laughs> some type of grassy material covered itself there. I guess I was lucky in that I, you know, because we didn't clear cut like was done for the house and put fill dirt down. He just basically took out the the green briar, all the brush, you know, stuff like that. So it's still native Florida soil there. And so what came up is what came up. There might have been a little of this Tahaya from the right of way, you know, found its way in. But I was worried because um, we had a big pile of kind of dirt there that we had someone smooth over. So I was worried about, am I going to have to try and put something there? And nature took care of that that for me. That is a, you know, quintessential freedom lawn. Some of the things that you may find, and we've been trained that these are bad things. But, you know, remember, we're going to let whatever grows, grows. Both Dr. Lester and I originated with Bahia grass. I still have a good amount of Bahia grass. Mine is still in areas of 75% Bahia. Yeah. And Bahia has a open growth habit that, you know, allows weeds in. And we have always been taught to see that as a negative. We're using it as a positive. Now, this is my backyard where I had my son-in-law place these pavers. And then I did nothing. <laughs> he placed the pavers and I did nothing. And you see what is filled in there. That's the, our classic crabgrass <laughs> that is filled in in our backyard. I think it looks pretty cool. It probably, you know, could be weed eated to look a little neater there, but it filled in right all, you know, along all those papers. Looks like I put it there on purpose. You will um, have sedges. I have lots of sedges. Sedges are triangular. Sedges have edges. That's how we know, you know, what they are and their stems. And they'll put up these little balls. And there's a common misconception because they look spiky. They look like green sand spurs. And even my daughter who grew up in Florida, she now lives in Pennsylvania, but she came back and she thought they were immature sand spurs. They're not, they never will. They're not gonna dry out and become sand spurs. That's just kind of what they, you know, their sedges, they are different. Um, sand spur is, I have some sand spur that finds its way into my yard. And I just pull it because that's not something I want there. <laughs> so um, kind of gotten a little out of control in the very back, but um, in the front, if any pops up at all, I'm pulling it and getting rid of it, hand pulling it. Um, is there a good herbicide, Dr. Lester, that really knows the difference between a grassy weed and the grass that you want to keep? No, there's very few. So if you're trying, if you have a traditional turf grass lawn and you have weeds in it, if you have broadleaf weeds, there's plenty of materials available that are going to control them. If you're trying to kill a grass that's growing in amongst another grass, there's very, very few options. And there's a few weeds that you may get in your lawn, a uh, common Bermuda. There's no good control for Bermuda. Crabgrass, you have to put down a pre-emergent in late winter, early spring. Uh, other, once the crabgrass is up and going, there's no good control. Torpedo grass is an invasive grass. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a freedom lawn, you're really, it's just gonna be one of the things in the mix. Torpedo grass, once it gets into a flower bed is a real nightmare to get rid of. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I, I literally, I pull it out of my, I don't know whether it's the torpedo grass or it's a Bermuda, the long stringy grasses. I pull it out of my, flower bed and I 
throw it in the lawn. It won't want to grow there. It wants the, the nice rich soil in my flower beds. Um, other weeds, quote, quote, that you may find uh, is chickweed, tassel flower. Those are kind of cool. Fleabane, I have, I put a picture of fleabane here. Carolina false dandelions, as well as traditional dandelions. We're not going to have a lot of traditional dandelions, not like they do up north. I've seen them in certain places, but not real often here. And I think how they got here was um, if I see them somewhere, it's somebody had some grass seed or something that, you know, it got there by human intervention, you know, however long ago. Um, Asiatic foxbeard. Dichondra is a nice little attractive little ground cover. And Virginia pepperweed. You may not know what any of these things look like, and I'm going to show you a resource, or you can just get a PDF of this and look them up. We have spurges, Carolina geranium, nice little flowers, native plant, henbit. This is a picture here of Florida betony. They also call it rattlesnake weed, because if you pull up, it has a tuber that looks like a rattle on a rattlesnake, which is edible, isn't it? Yeah, it is edible. I've never tried it, but I know that and it, it is edible. Like horseradish or something, they say. Yeah. Bigger weeds, you know, that's not something pleasant to walk through because you get all, you know, certain times of year you get it on you. But uh, pollinators love it. Black medic is actually yellow flowers. Um, yellow wood sorrel, oxalis, that might be what northerners confuse and call clover. It has a clover look to it. Um, we have that. Plantains are pretty, you know, your classic, you look at it and say weed. Um, but, and Florida Pusley, and I think I may have put in a picture of that um, on here. We'll have to see coming up. Um, all of these attract pollinators. So, you know, that cannot be a bad thing. Here's Dr. Lester's favorite. So I'll let him <laughs> talk about this multi-named uh, ground cover, really. Yeah, turkey tangle fog fruit basically came with my yard. I never put it here, but I have several large patches of it. And one area is just outside the window here. And I always cut my grass high. So even though it's a mixture of bahia grass and a variety of different weeds. I try to cut it like four inches tall. Mm -hmm. So that turkey tangle, fog fruit, and a lot, a few of those other weeds grow very, very low naturally. So if you cut the grass a four inches high, you're really not cutting much of it off. Right. But this plant is a host plant for the white peacock butterflies, which were out about a week ago. They come out at the very, very end of summer. Uh, Fayon Crescent, Buckeye. My backyard is literally filled with butterflies for a good part of the summer, just from the ground cover that I have mixed in with the grass that the tiny caterpillars are feeding on. I'd have to go out there and search to find them because they're very small mm -hmm. and they eventually hatch into just flocks of small butterflies that are all over the yard. Yeah. So for anybody trying to put in a butterfly garden, you're wondering, how come I don't have any butterflies? Where are they? How can I get them here? This is a great plant. Even if you wanted to put it in a flower bed or a, more, a smaller, more organized contained area, it's a great uh, butterfly host plant and attractor. I um, created a wildflower garden and it put itself there. So I'm not about to take it out, but um, I think that is what is inhibiting that sun sunshine the most <laughs> that I planted there. That and I put the sunshine mimosa down with too much mulch. And I learned later that wildflowers and mimosa like that, it needs the bare dirt to spread on. So I've been finding pieces of it and moving it to that area I showed you that, you know, to the lot. Um, so maybe the lot that we purchased, so maybe it'll start spreading over there. Here's another, um, this is a spring um, flowering. People call weed. It's, isn't it absolutely gorgeous to call this poor thing weed? The blue eyed grass. The name bothers me. The name's always bothered me. 
because that is not a blue eye. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a yellow eye, <laughs> but um, it is blue, much bluer than my camera caught here, you know, pretty violet colored. Um, but boy, when I took this picture, uh, was during the COVID lockdown and I was working from home and I knew my neighbor had, uh, I think he put down some seed, probably winter rye or something like that. And I was talking to him and I fell on the ground all excited. Um, on purpose, I fell on the ground <laughs> because I'm like, you have blue-eyed grass. And he's like, yeah, I know it was stuck in with this. You know, he was like not happy about it. And I was thrilled because it's the most beautiful little flower, I think. It usually blooms in like April, April, May, sometime around then. They're small, but the rest of the plant is kind of grassy looking. So, you know, I think you're very lucky if you have that. A lot, a lot of people, you could go out right now and find this uh, portulaco, purslane, primrose, whatever you want to call it. You can find the pink ones, you can find the yellow. They're kind of a trailing succulent and they seem to like bare dirt areas, don't they? You know? Yeah, I have them in my yard. They prefer cooler weather, so you'll see them a lot more in the winter. Mm -hmm. And even like on sidewalks next to roads where nobody is taking care of that sidewalk at all, you know, you'll find this growing there. Pretty little flower, you know, why, you know, why would you disparage it? Here's kind of a taller weed. It might get to be, you know, a foot tall. And you look at that and you think weed. But really look at it. This um, liar leaf sage. See why it's a liar leaf? shaped like the musical instrument and um you know it's flowering so it's going to be attracting pollinators it's one of the nice things and our florida green eyes appropriately named because it has green eyes um, <laughs> um it's called florida green eyes because it only grows in florida it's endemic to florida so you may have, you know, quite a bit of these, even though up north you may have had dandelions, here you're going to have these Florida green eyes. I see no reason to, you know, ban them from <laughs> your yard. I think they're beautiful little flowers. Now, one of the um, ways that I have used for years to identify these is by using this book, Weeds of Southern Turf Grasses. Yeah, I have one right here. And it is interesting because it does not suggest control measures. It's really just ID. And, and, and it's very extensive ID. Helps you. I look through it to say, I have that, I have that, I have that, I have that. But really, probably it was supposed to be used as ID so you follow up with control. I like to use it just for ID, you know, so I know what I have. Um, and see, this one has University of Florida written on it. The one I took a picture of there or got from the internet has uh, University of Georgia. And the reason I did that is because you used to be able to get this from the um, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences bookstore, but no longer, correct? Dr. Lesson? Correct. It's the, Unfortunately, that book is out of print. It used to go for Ten dollars or less. It was ten dollars for a while. Eight dollars for a long, long, long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bumped it up to fourteen. So this University of Georgia link I have here will tell you they have it for fourteen, but it's out of stock. <laughs> um. So I found out in the process that uh, yeah, you can find it on Amazon or any of those other type of places where you can purchase books, $50, $70. This little book is not worth that much money. Do not spend that much money on it, especially when you can go to this link that I have found here through the University of Florida, where you can see each page. They kind of, you know, it shows you like almost like a photograph of each page of this book. So it's not as fun as holding the book in your hand, you know, and it might aggravate you to have to do it that way. But if you really want to see them, 
that is a resource or make a friend of a master gardener and you know <laughs> make a good offer on their weeds or southern turf grasses and um you can't have this one sorry um <laughs> because i it's it is a great resource you know to help id it's called weeds of southern turf grasses i refer to it as wildflowers of southern <laughs> turf grasses and speaking of wildflowers and native plants, I got this from the Florida Wildflower Foundation, just so you know, you're aware of the importance of letting these quote, quote, weeds grow in our freedom lawns. There are 3,200 native plants in Florida. 230 of them, like that Florida green eyes, are endemic, meaning they only grow in Florida. There's 170 endemic wildflowers. But 566 of those 3,200 are threatened and endangered. Why? Let's go back to that monoculture of lawns, 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 lawns. In Florida, I'm surprised it's this low on the list, <laughs> is the seventh most botanically diverse state in the contiguous U.S. So we're not counting Hawaii, which I'm sure is very botanically diverse. Um, I'm surprised we're down to seven because, you know, Ponce de Leon named us Land of the Flowers. I did try to look up what the, and I, I didn't get number six, but what the, the ones before us were, which is, of course, California and next Texas. Size. Size and the range, you know, that they cover. You won't believe what number three was, though. It was Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I don't remember the ones after that, but we're number seven. So it's important. Not only is it going to be easier for you work wise to have this freedom lawn, it's important, you know, to save these quote, quote, save the weeds <laughs> the um, and the wildflowers. Here is our little is that the Buckeye, I think. I think so, yes. Yes. About the size of a quarter is how big all three of those butterflies are on that turkey tangle fog fruit <laughs> or frog fruit, whatever you want to call it. So how are we going to start? And this I did get from um, Green Gardening Matters, uh, Ginny Steibel. Some of you may follow her. How, you know, I've got a regular lawn. How do I even start having a freedom lawn? You and I have just done that all along. We just let whatever grow, grow, because we're in areas. Now, you know, I'm the county, and I'm sure every municipality does have, you know, very basic rules that you can't have nine inch tall grass. <laughs> so, you know, to keep that in mind. So it is good to keep it um, tidy, but how are you gonna do this? You're gonna start with your lawn, Stop all chemical applications so that turf grass can just be like, oh, finally, you know, and, and ease that stress on that turf. Fertilizing it, you're forcing it to grow, you know, putting other chemicals, it just it really stresses it. So we're going to stop doing that. How important is mowing high, Dr. Lester? That's very important. I aim to cut my grass four inches high. And keep in mind, it's, you know, part grass, part weeds, part a variety of different things, but all of them benefit from being cut taller and not lower. That is extremely important if you are trying to maintain, you know, a um, more formal floor tam lawn. It's, it's, it's extraordinarily important, but even for our freedom lawns, because you let the roots grow deeper that way, you will you know, provide more surface area for these things to photosynthesize. It'll just be happier when we're not trying to make it a putting green. That's what it boils down to. If you do irrigate, don't just stop. <laughs> you know, If you're trying to create a freedom lawn, you wanna gradually decrease, maybe, if, um, you know, kind of in the wrong time of year right now, but a good time to have started that may have been, okay, I'm going to start this process in the summer, let nature do all the watering, you know, but if you're watering once a week, 
really it is kind of a good time of year because um, your lawn's going to go semi dormant. So we encourage you to skip a week anyway. So yeah, as the daylight hours get shorter, we encourage you to skip a week because your lawn's not really growing much as it was in the summer. So and then, you know, over time you know, kind of wean it off <laughs> of your irrigation system so that the roots can start going down deeper. And for the first year or two, a compost material, remember I replaced mulch as a principal with compost in the late fall and early spring. How would you suggest going about doing that, Dr. Lester? Any kind of Compost or organic material is going to be a really big benefit for anything from a traditional turf grass lawn to a more um, freedom lawn type of situation. So if you make your own compost and you have enough to spare, you can sprinkle that or scatter it very lightly over your lawn. Uh, several bags of products that you might be able to get at a big box store, something like black cow cow manure or bags of compost, just scattered very, very lightly over the lawn. And then once it gets watered in or rained in, it's gonna to help to build up the soil. Research is finding that that is a huge benefit for uh, formal St. Augustine lawns, one of the best things you could do for it. And no matter what you have, you know, if it's a, a combination of Bahia grass and turkey tangle fog fruit and this and that, Every plant's gonna benefit from more organic matter because we have so little here in Florida. We have very sandy soils. And it, most of us you know, have homes that were, the fill dirt was put in before the home was built, unless you happen to maybe like have a mobile that was moved out in the woods, you know, which would, then you have nice native <laughs> soil. Um, but a lot of us live on at least a quarter acre where they put a whole bunch of fill dirt, which is taken deep down in the soil profile, has zero anything in it. So adding this composted material starts to add those microbes back up and starts to help your lawn be, your soil be alive again. And as I mentioned before, we look at some of, um, you know, we want to do something different with our lawn and it doesn't occur to us, we can have this freedom lawn or even those ground cover alternatives in a smaller area than where we had the lawn by building out beds, flower beds, uh, shrub beds, things like that. And the most reasonable place to start would be around trees, you know, to and start spreading out from there and actually reduce the size of those quote, quote, lawn areas. So all we are saying, <laughs> I might get it every time I, uh, well, it's a different word in it. Anytime I hint at a song, I get a little note from Facebook that tells me in 17 um, uh, areas around the world, they have muted me from saying that, but it's never in the United States. So all we are saying <laughs> is give weeds a chance. <laughs> that's, that's what we're saying with our freedom lawns. And I'll get to the chat in a moment, but probably after I turn the recording off and then we can continue to chat. Um, here are some of the resources I use to find this information about freedom lawns. And again, if you can find that weeds of the Southern turf grasses, do not pay $50 for it. But if we can Please, find it. Somebody asked if you could uh, share the link for the, the photos of the pages in the chat box. Um, okay, I will try. Yeah, when we when we turn the recording off, we'll see if we can do that. Um, I do have upcoming classes next week. You're going to be with me again. Um, yeah, we need to go over that list of creepy crawlies that we want to introduce. <laughs> the cryptic lives of Florida bugs. That is our special Halloween edition of <laughs> our Florida friendly landscaping educational programs. Then in November, I'll be pretty much on my own because Dr. Lester has a whole lot of paperwork he wants to do and told me he would not play with me that month <laughs> and give classes. <laughs> so I have much ado about mulch coming up November 2nd. November 9th, I will be in person at the Spring Hill Library um, 
presenting Florida's fall flower power. That is available. I did it virtually like this, and it is available on Hernando County Government YouTube if you want to watch it as well. November 16th, we'll be back virtual. I will be back for Florida Friendly Container Gardening for Ornamentals. I have to be careful if I say gardening that you know vegetables are your bailiwick. If I'm talking about it, <laughs> it's, it's ornamental flowers. And at the end of November, we'll have Florida Friendly Gardening for the seasonal resident. A bunch of them should be back. I'm also going to be presenting that at the library in July. So if you know someone who's coming down who refuses to do the Zoom and <laughs> look at the uh, library classes, and I'll be talking um, in January about that. And here are our various media outlets. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Hernando County Government YouTube. I'm getting real close to 100 programs on that. So anything you want to hear about, you should be able to find on my playlist, Florida Friendly Landscaping on Hernando County Government YouTube. I'm also um, new, but I'm starting on Twitter and Instagram as well. Here are our emails again. So um, give us a call or I mean, email us and we'll be glad to answer anything. Um, if you're here live, stay with us. Um, I'll turn the recording off and we will address the chat. But otherwise, thank you, Dr. Lester for joining me today. Thank and, you. Yes, I learn. I always learn a lot. That's why I hang around with smart people. So yeah, I can suck information out of their brains. <laughs> that, that's all that I do. Thank you, everybody. And have a great Florida friendly week. And we will see you again next week. <music>